right, welcome everyone to today's um, presentation. And you are certainly exploring uh, CACRO's virtual college exploration. I just wanna make sure we go over some housekeeping um, ideas. We are, um, of course, presenting this to you today, sponsored by CACRO, which is the Carolinas Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admissions Officers. It's kind of a lot to say. Um, thank you for joining us. And here are some things we're gonna go over. Um, first of all, how do you answer, uh, ask and answer questions from the panelists? We want you, the participants, to ask your questions in the question and answer um, button in the field that you're gonna see on your screen. Just type in your questions to the presenters and someone on the uh, presentation today will certainly be um, helping to answer those questions. You are muted and your camera is off and you cannot change that. So right now the panelists can't see or hear you and they won't be able to. So the only way remember to interact with them is to make sure you're asking the questions in the question and answer. Um, this is just one of many, many sessions that we're hosting in the next couple of weeks. So certainly make sure that if you want to sign up for any more uh, presentations or specific college uh, information sessions, go to www.cacro.org, that's C-A-C-R-A-O.org. And we will have a recording of this available too. Um, after the presentation, it may take about a week before we post it to the same CACRO website, at C-A-C-R-A-O.org. So I hope that's helped today, and um, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera and uh, mute myself, and so the presenters can begin. I think Allie? Thank you so much, Amy. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Navigating Financial Aid presentation. Just let me go ahead and share my presentation with you quickly. All right, here we go. So. So even though we aren't able to see you or, um, or anything like that, I think I can see that there are over 20 of you here. So, so thank you so, so much. Um, part of why we really, really wanted to make this happen is because we know that financial aid is, is, is um, financial aid is something that, um, fi fi financial aid is something is something that can cause lots and lots of stress. And so we want to make this as easy as possible um, for, for each and every one of you. So I just wanted to let you know that since financial aid is something that can be kind of complicated, um, lots of our slides will have tons of words, but do not, um, um, but, but, uh, but we, we are going to be sending you a, um, but yeah, we, we're going to send a recording of this afterwards. Um, so please ask any and all questions that you have and any questions that we aren't able to, um, any questions we aren't able to answer now, we are going to answer via email sometime within the next two weeks. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce all of our wonderful panelists, starting with myself. Uh, my name is Allie Glover. I'm an admissions counselor at Queens. Um, we are a small, we are small, um, we're a small college that is located in Charlotte. Um, and now I'm going to turn things over to our next panelist to introduce herself. Hi everyone, my name is Tracy Martinez. I work for, I'm one of the admissions counselors for Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. Nice to meet y'all. Hey guys, my name is Kelsey McGaha and I'm an admissions counselor at Campbell University, which is in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. Um, Kyle is gonna introduce himself next. Thanks, Kelsey. Hey, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, I should say, at this point. Uh, my name is Kyle Cross. I'm an admissions counselor at East Carolina University, and that is in Greenville, North Carolina. I'm going to be presenting the first topic here, and we're going to be going over some general information about the FAFSA. So if you want, um, Allie, you can go ahead and click over to the next slide, and I will begin. So what is the FAFSA? Uh, to sum it up very briefly, the FAFSA is the most important document that you are probably going to fill out when you are considering your financial aid. 
The FAFSA is an acronym and it stands for the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And it's completed by all students, whether they're current students that are actually enrolled at that college or university or prospective students, meaning seniors or transfer students at a community college transferring to a four-year school. Each one of those students, no matter who you are, is going to be filling out the FAFSA. It's completed at this link down here at the bottom, studentaid.gov, and you'll have to create an account, save your FSA ID, and log in and complete that FAFSA. Uh, and we'll talk about when you have to complete it and how many times you'll have to turn that in over your career. The only word I really want to emphasize on that last slide, and that's fine, is free. It is a free application. It will not cost you anything other than a couple minutes of your time uh, throughout your day. So we always say utilize that and do that as early as possible. So how do you receive your federal student aid, your financial aid from the FAFSA? Well, there are different things that make you eligible and I'll kind of go through those. We have a graphic here, um, but again, I'll briefly explain each one. You need to have either received your high school diploma or GED. You need to be enrolled at a university or be accepted to be enrolled. You can fill out your FAFSA before you were actually enrolled at that university and submit it. They just will not award you your financial aid until after you are accepted and enrolled at the university, meaning you signed up for some classes. If you're a male, you'll need to be registered with the Selective Service, which is mandatory for males that are over the age of 18 and between the ages of 18 and 25. So you need to make sure that you sign up for Selective Service. You need to have a Social Security number you need to sign those certifying statements from your FAFSA, meaning after you complete it, you need to sign it pretty much. Uh, you need to maintain satisfactory academic progress in college. And the key thing is you need to either be a U.S. citizen or you must have a green card to turn in an arrival or departure uh, record, which is an I-94 record. You need to have a battered immigrant status or a T visa. Now, if you're a little confused on which ones you have and which ones you need to turn in, that is where you can reach out to that financial aid department or the admissions department, and we'll be more than happy to walk you through what you'll need to turn in when you apply. But that's kind of a general overview of what you need to be able to receive financial aid. When you're getting ready to fill out the, fa the FAFSA, what do you need to have sitting in front of you? What do you need to have ready at your side? So the first two bullets I've kind of bolded to emphasize because they're the most important ones. You will need your federal tax returns and your information uh, most likely through a form of a W-2, and that is for the student. If you're, you know, if you're filing as a dependent, which we'll go over that shortly as well, which means you're filing under your parents, your parents will need to turn in either an IRS 1040, 1040-NR, or IRS 1040-NR-EZ. Either one of those forms, again, if you're a little confused over what you need, that's where you can reach out to our office and we'll be happy to explain what you'll need to turn in. Of course, you'll need your social security number. We just kind of went over that, but you will also need your parent's social security number, your alien registration number if you're not a U.S. citizen, your driver's license uh, number if you have one, and then you also need to have records of untaxed income and info about cash savings, and the amount in your checking account and savings account. So here is an actual screenshot from the FAFSA. We were mentioning a dependent versus independent student, and these are the qualifications that will mark you as a independent student. So if you were going to check any one of the boxes that you see here on the screen, it would therefore make you an independent student and you would not need to file with your parents' information. As you can see, if you um, check any of those boxes, it tells you to skip to page four. Now the pages that you skip are literally labeled parents' information. So if you're an independent student, it tells you to skip to page four and you skip the parent section, you will not need any of their information. If you don't check up any of these boxes, you will proceed to the next page where you'll have to fill in your parents' information but just kind of briefly go over uh, the most common ones that we kind of received. You were born before that date, January 1st, 1997. You were married. You came back as a veteran of the armed forces, or you're actually working on your master's or doctoral program, or you have dependents of your own that are also going through college or live with you for support. Uh, again, 
Any clarification on any one of those, we're a phone call away, and every one of our panelists, their office is a phone call away, as well as their financial aid department. We can go ahead and keep on going to the next slide. So when and how often? This is um, telling you how much you're gonna have to be concerned about your FAFSA and how often you're gonna have to be concerned about it. Each and every year, you're going to have to fill out the FAFSA. Just because the financial aid can update, uh, you know, you could have a new form of income from your parents that you'll have to clarify, and that may increase or decrease your financial aid. So that is kind of why you have to fill it out each and every year. Now, the term in front uh, quotations is the prior prior year. And the best way to explain that is with that second bullet uh, under it, where it says, for example, so it shows you a date of October 1st, 2020, this upcoming October, you would fill that FAFSA out for the 2021-2022 year. And that's why it means prior prior. Those two years are before the year that you're actually enrolling. So that means next year when you're trying to fill out one for the 2022-2023 year, you would fill it out October 1st, 2021, so on and so forth, continuing on until you're actually graduated. The thing that I wanna point out the most on this slide is definitely that second to last bullet that says completing the FAFSA early is important. It is key. Uh, the best way to explain this is a set of twins that I actually worked with in the past, uh, where one twin, they've done everything together their whole entire life, and they turned in one FAFSA thinking it would apply to both of them. I mean, they have the same information, same parents, so on and so forth. They're literally identical. Uh, unfortunately, it only accounts for one student, so that second twin didn't find out until a couple months later, and that second twin actually received a little bit less uh, than her a couple seconds older older sister. So that's kind of frustrating, and it goes to show you how important it is to turn it in earlier rather than later. It's going to open up October 1st, and ours for ET specifically will close February 14th or Valentine's Day. So you always need to check in with different offices to find out when that priority deadline is for your school and for your FAFSA, just because it may be a little different. Um, but another little key point to keep in mind is that if you're trying to enroll in the spring, you know, you're gonna graduate a semester early, or you wanna take summer classes to try and get ahead before your freshman year, you will need to complete the FAFSA for the 2021, or excuse me, 2020 to 2021 year, just because you are starting in that previous academic term uh, of basically your senior year where a student who was a graduating senior would not be attending ECU. So that's why you would, or, or attending that college or university, excuse me for showing bias, um, but that is why you would have to fill out that a little bit earlier that year beforehand. But we'll go ahead and continue on to the next slide. And what if I have not completed any taxes beforehand? Um, so there are different ways to go about trying to solve that issue, solve that problem. If there was no tax return filed for the previous year, uh, your parent can turn in a W-2 or a 1099 to complete that FAFSA. Uh, you can also, your parent can also provide the last pay stub that they have to, to complete it. Now, if you have never turned in any tax information, the best way to go about it is to contact a tax professional. Now, we of course can guide you with some simple, you know, anyone in our office, uh, as well as all these other panelists can guide you in the direction that you'll need to take to fix that issue, but it's always best to talk to an accountant or a tax professional just because they'll know exactly what forms you may need and what you may need to fill out. And it may change year to year, so it's always best to contact one of those professionals if that issue does arise. Let me continue on. So two terms that I wanna go over, you'll see a lot of abbreviated terms on the FAFSA. Uh, these are two of the most important your expected family contribution, as well as your family financial need. Now the expected, the EFC, the expected family contribution is a number that determines the eligibility for different types of aid. When you turn in that FAFSA, you're gonna get back what's called a student aid report, a STAR, which is another abbreviation. That report is just showing you the numbers. It's gonna show you what your expected family contribution is, and it's gonna show you uh, what your financial need is. And I'll explain that at the very bottom bullet. Uh, so what, how that kind of goes is when they get that ESC, when the financial aid department receives it, they subtract it from the total cost of attendance. And that is different from tuition. Cost of attendance includes books, transportation fees, all the little fees that associate with outside of room and board and tuition costs. So you need to look at those two separate things. Cost of attendance is different than tuition. It will subtract, subtract it from the cost of attendance 
and then that remaining dollar amount is your financial need. It's what you need need-based aid for. And I'll explain that very briefly here in this last bullet, and then we'll continue on to our next presenter. Uh, but fa uh, excuse me, family financial need is the remaining balance after that ESD has been subtracted. And it helps cover some other types of need-based aid that we will go over later in the presentation. So the best way to explain it is kind of in terms of, let's say your total, your total cost of attendance is $18,000. When you turn in your FAFSA and you get your student aid report back, it says your ESC or expected family contribution is $10,000. So after you subtract that from the cost of attendance, it leaves you with $8,000. And that is your family financial need. That is what's gonna determine your need-based aid. That is where, as we'll go over later in the presentation, you'll be getting some of those other grants and loans to try and assist with that payment. But that is kind of my section. That is a very brief overview of the FAFSA. There are a lot of different questions that may arise, and that's why we always say, reach out to our office. We are here to help. We're here to help you explain these things. But for now, I'll turn it over to our second presenter, Ms. Kelsey from Campbell University, who is a senior admissions counselor and has a tons uh, and a wealth of knowledge about the financial aid process. So be sure to tune in uh, for the rest of the presentation to hear some great information and great tips. So thank you so much. Thanks, Kyle. Um, you did a great job. I really don't think um, of anyone I know that could have explained it better. So wonderful job, Kyle. Um, and like he said, it is a lot of information and it is complicated, but we're definitely here to help and our financial aid offices are here to help as well. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get into speaking about the financial aid package itself and that letter and what that looks like and kind of what those things mean. Um, so what is a financial aid package? So a financial aid package is the total amount of financial aid, both federal and non-federal, um, that a student is offered by a college. So once the student completes a FAFSA and submits it to their schools of interest, the school will award the package once that federal or, or state fund um, amounts are allocated. The colleges require information from the government in order to award the packages. Um, and so it's not something that, you know, we're waiting on the school to hear back, we're waiting on the school. A lot of times those schools hands can be tied by either the federal or state government because those funds are allocated as part of the federal budget and the state budget. Um, so while the legislators are making their decisions and that those bills are kind of um, in limbo of being passed, we really can't do anything as an institution. And so we can estimate based off of historical data, but honestly, your best bet is to just be patient. And whenever it comes out, you know, typically for Campbell, it is um, around March, but once that comes out, we're happy to go over everything together. You still have time to, to figure those things out and to work with us until the student would enroll that fall. Um, so your financial aid package items that are directly from the FAFSA. Um, I just want to remind you guys before we go into this that as we go over these various types of aid awarded to students, I just want to emphasize that you may or may not be eligible for all of the types of aid shown. Um, so your individual FAFSA that you complete, that will determine what you receive for most of your award letter. And so your gift aid, including the grants that you see here at the federal level, um, including your scholarships like the North Carolina need-based scholarship and other states, have, a lot of them have similar scholarships that are allocated to residents of that state. Um, you know, those funds, like I said, may not be offered every year. So if the student's financial situation changes, they might lose eligibility for that grant or they may gain eligibility for an additional grant that next year. The funding, like I said, comes from that federal budget and that state budget. And so if those allocations change, then the grants may no longer be available. Um, but based on that FAFSA application, North Carolina does offer the North Carolina Need-Based Scholarship, the NBS. I know Kyle is getting into some of those acronyms. So here's another fun one for you. Don't feel the pressure to memorize the acronyms. There are much more important things in the college process um, than memorizing the financial aid acronyms. So don't worry about that. I'm, but work study is mentioned here at the bottom, federal work study. So that's something that based off of the, the FAFSA, you may see that you are eligible for that or your student is eligible for that. Um, so that is also not a guarantee. So just because you're eligible for it, it's up to the student to seek out on-campus work 
employment, through the work study programs at the schools, which happen to all function differently. Um, we like to make it extra complicated as universities. Um, but no, typically all that information can be found right on the website. But the funds from work study, they're not allocated up front. So just because you qualify for X amount of work study does not mean that they're going to go ahead and send you a check or go ahead and put that into your account. Um, it's just like any other job where you have to earn that money before they pay you. Um, so work study compensation, it doesn't help pay off those expenses that may come at the start of the semester, like books or tuition um, and costs that aren't covered by scholarships and grants that are listed here and some ones on the next page we'll get into in a little bit. Um, they're not if your cost of, to attend the school, if it's not covered by these scholarships and grants, then obviously it has to be paid in some other format. Um, so whether that's, you know, we call that out of pocket. So it could be a loan. Um, so you'll see on here beneath scholarship bullet, federal loans. Um, so most students will have that on their financial aid package. They'll have direct unsubsidized loans and they'll have a direct subsidized loan and they'll have an amount that you qualify for there. Um, so you'll have to, go ahead and go in and use that type of money to pay off the cost that's remaining. Um, and we're gonna get into that in a little bit more detail as far as what order to take things out. Um, actually, the next presenter in a little bit is gonna speak to that. But um, you know, any of those costs that are, are remaining after these scholarships and these grants, um, you can use these loans, you could get private loans if you're, you have a, a, an amount above and beyond the federal loans that you're eligible for, um, or other funding sources. So the, where you see the PLUS loan, the Parent PLUS loan there, that's something else that a lot of students will have listed on their financial aid award letter. And that's something that also must be applied for separately. So the parent must, um, go in and apply for that separately. So it is, once again, a credit-based thing like most loans, and a lot of parents do choose to do that option um, when helping their, their child pay for school. Um, so we're gonna go on and talk about some financial aid packages that are um, information that's not necessarily from the FAFSA. So other types of aid that will be shown um, are your scholarships. So whether that's an institutional scholarship from the college, um, so for example, at Campbell, we offer merit or academic scholarships. Merit and academic are kind of interchangeable, um, but it's based off of your um, academic performance through junior year of high school, if you're a traditional incoming freshman. Um, but these types of aid here, like I said, they're not um, based on your FAFSA application. They're just based off of you know, academics or, or your outside scholarships, thing that, things that you've applied for that. And um, whenever you look at athletic scholarships, you know, we're Campbell's a division one school and oftentimes athletes get those scholarships. Um, sometimes they're program based scholarships. Like if you are a music major and you audition, you could get X amount of, of scholarship money. If you're an education major and, you know, obviously there's a need for teachers, um, you know, there are scholarships for that sometimes. Um, very similar with endowed scholarships that those typically have to be applied for separately after the first year. Um, sponsored scholarships as well. Some schools will offer that and you have to fit certain eligibility requirements in order to apply for those. Um, but once again, this is typically going to be found on your school's admissions and financial aid websites and kind of go into a little bit more detail there. Um, but like I mentioned before, whenever those costs that are remaining are not covered by any of these scholarships and grants, um, we talked about the loans at the federal level that you may be eligible for on the last slide. But on this one, it does talk about private loans as well. Um, typically, students will opt to do the federally funded um, loans just because typically the interest rates are lower than those private loans um, because, you know, private loans can be for a wide variety of things and not necessarily specifically for higher education purposes. Um, but I definitely encourage you whenever you're thinking about outside scholarships and, um, you know, there are some available at the local level and a lot of the high school counselors can be a wonderful resource for these. If you have power school or some type of online system that you communicate with your um, school, a lot of times they'll post those opportunities there. Um, so you'll have local ones, there are statewide ones, there are national scholarships as well. I um, mean, obviously your chances of winning a local one is a lot higher than a national one because that pool of applicants is so much smaller. 
Um, so you're looking at those national scholarships a lot of times, like obviously someone's going to win them, but it's sort of, can, you can compare it to like winning the lottery a lot of times. Um, so definitely encourage you guys, look for those local and state scholarships, spend your time um, focusing on those for those outside scholarships. And a lot of those like the sponsored scholarships, you do have to fall into a certain criteria, whether it's, you know, future doctor, whether it's, um, you know, you're going to study XYZ, you're going to a certain college, some of those scholarships only cover, you know, if you're going to a state school. Um, so there's a lot of different criteria. So read the criteria really well, because you obviously don't want to spend all your time working on that essay and that application just to find out, oh, well, I'm actually not eligible. Um, that would be terrible. So we definitely want to encourage you guys to, um, you know, be thorough in looking at those outside scholarships as well. Um, so next, we're going to go over a couple different examples of some financial aid letters and what they might look like. So I'm a visual person. I know a lot of the students that I meet with and talk to, they're visual people. Um, and so I think that it helps to kind of see something that's, it's still words and numbers, but it's, it's, in a, it's in a visual instead of just a bulleted list. Um, and so I hope this will be helpful as well. Um, so the format and information provided on the financial aid letter, it's going to vary from college to college. So I actually have three examples here. Um, this is just the first one. So your aid is typically broken down by semester with the last column showing the total amount. So that's over there on the right. And then obviously the complete total down at the bottom right. Um, so as I emphasized earlier, you may not be eligible for all of these types of aid. Um, you may get your financial aid letter and it doesn't have the federal Pell Grant that's listed here. Um, it may not have the um, state scholarship listed on it there. May not have the federal work study, but you know, depending on your need and what your um, FAFSA results in, then it could be something different. Um, you see some more acronyms there that you don't necessarily have to worry about. Um, but this kind of breaks it down by, okay, for the fall semester, I have this amount. For the spring semester, I have this amount. And um, for this example, they happen to be the exact same amounts for both. Sometimes it's a little bit different. Um, sometimes it can be like 1,000 for the fall and 1,500 for the spring. So there's a couple different options um, that you will see. So this is just the first example. I think this is the best example. Um, any schools that have this type of layout, it's very helpful, um, especially compared to some of the other ones that we're gonna see. But um, most of the award letters that look like this at the bottom, um, I kind of cropped all of these examples to just show the aid portion. So typically at the top of your award letter, it'll show like the estimated cost of attendance. It'll show here's the tuition. And once again, it'll break down by semester, fall, spring in total. Um, and typically it'll show tuition, room and board. It'll show, um, you know, estimated meal plan. And so typically those are averages. So the average freshman female residence hall or male residence hall, you know, combined together, this is the average. So whenever you look at your financial aid letter, you're getting those averages. Um, once again, on here, you know, they qualify for what federal work study. But like I said before, that has to be earned. So whenever you look at that total amount of cost minus aid, it gives you a rough estimate, but it is not set in stone. Like this is how much you need to write the check for. Like that's, that's not at all. Um, you know, I think a lot of students think that that's how it works and parents as well, but that's really, it's, it's an estimate. Um, so just, just kind of take what you see with a grain of salt until you get, um, you know, qualified for maybe the Parent PLUS loan and those types of things. So as you get further on, um, closer to enrolling in the fall, you'll be able to get actual bills from the business office that reflect all of your um, full information. So Allie went ahead and went on to this second example here. Um, and so you'll be able to see that um, on this one, it's called a school scholarship. From the last one, it was called a dean's, or on this one, it's called a dean's scholarship. And on the last one, it said school scholarship. And for Campbell, it would say academic or merit. Um, so just know that those are the same things. Um, this one also offers a university grant. So that may be something that is um, a need-based grant. So Campbell offers a, a need-based grant as well. That's something new that we're offering this year. Um, so it's important to know with those what requirements exist in order for you to get that scholarship every year, the Dean's Scholarship, the University Grant, because 
you know, if that aid is not available every year, that's a lot of extra financial responsibility for the family to take on. When you look at those totals of 13,000 and 16,000, you need to be aware of what that, um, you know, what do you have to maintain? Do you have to maintain a certain GPA? What is that GPA? Is it realistic to go, you'll be able to do that? Um, so there's all sorts of fun stuff that we have to read between the lines on, but you do see federal Pell Grant listed there. Um, on here, they just put SEOG on the last one. It spelled out what that acronym was. Um, you'll see on here the direct subsidized and unsubsidized. Um, so once again, different layout, different information. It's called an offer of assistance instead of aid. Um, but a lot of it is the same thing. It's just different jargon, different lingo that these schools use. Um, so we'll go on to the third example. Um, so this example, um, it's very, very, very simplistic, which doesn't necessarily make it helpful. Um, so you see these tricky abbreviations a lot of times. You'll see parent plus L. Well, it doesn't even say loan, so it's kind of hard to know that. Um, so some schools might use letters like this um, to explain your package. And so it can make it hard to distinguish between like what's a gift aid, like a grant or a scholarship, and what's a loan? What am I gonna have to pay back? So this is not clear at all. It also doesn't break down your semester. So this is like your total for the year, I'm assuming. It doesn't even tell you. Um, so whenever, if a school does give you a letter like this, then you're gonna have to go above and beyond. Doesn't mean that school is worse or anything like that, but you know, you're, it's just gonna make you have to do more research um, to figure these types of things out. So definitely utilize, like I said, your admissions counselors and your um, financial aid offices. Um, so definitely clarify with the offices if those grants are available every year um, or just for the first year. So that was the, the final example and I'm gonna kind of summarize everything. So I encourage you guys, um, when comparing cost of the individual schools by their award letters, um, it can be hard because the letters may look different, they may be called different things. So you definitely have to read beyond the bottom line. Um, know each school's individual calculations for their direct and indirect costs. So there may be some costs that would be direct, like your tuition, like your room and board, like your meal plan, but there may be some that's like indirect, like um, is there, are there parking fees? Are there, um, are there fees to use the laundry? Um, you know, what groceries am I going to have to get above and beyond? What are my costs to um, travel to this school? Am I flying to this school? Am I doing a long drive? Um, you know, when you have, if you want to get down into kind of the nitty gritty of total cost, then you have to look at direct and indirect, um, as well as what the things like you'll need to attend, um, sort of like school supplies and things like that. So computers and things of that nature. Um, so it's important to have a contingency plan as well if some forms of aid aren't available after the first year of school. Um, so say you did get the state-based scholarship, like the North Carolina need-based, and then the next year it wasn't approved in their budget um, for the state, and so that funding went away. Or um, say that your, financial aid, your financials changed um, from one year to the next. Um, and you no longer qualify for that. You have to have a contingency plan because we all know that just because we, it shows that we don't, um, you know, we, we make too much money to get anything from the federal government. Well, that also doesn't mean that you can pay for college, right? Um, so that was, that was my situation. Like my parents made just a little bit too much to get aid, but they still didn't have a big pot of money sitting there to pay for my school. So you have to think about those contingency plans. Um, and wading through award letters and calculating the cost, it can be difficult. So like I've, we've all reiterated, please utilize us. Um, as admissions counselors, our job is to help you. So we're not doing our job well if you're confused about these things, if you're um, not understanding them clearly. So please make sure that um, we're doing our jobs well, hold us accountable in that and the financial aid offices as well, because we're literally here to help you guys. Um, so the last one, research equals savings. Putting in the effort to research this information, it can save you thousands of dollars in student loan payments down the line or even you know, in funds right now. So 
um, I definitely encourage you guys to do that research. Um, and I hope that this section has been helpful. And um, there is gonna be a little bit more explanation coming up from Ms. Tracy. Um, so I'm gonna hand it over to Tracy from Mercer. Hello, everyone. Um, so now let's talk about finalizing your uh, financial aid. And so now that you know about FAFSA, now that you've gone through all that, let's get down to hopefully making the best decision that's right for you. And so some ways to do that is definitely stay on top of your emails, your postal mail, your uh, student portal or just portal. Some colleges will give you that once you apply. So staying on top of those is very important because you may need to uh, submit some additional uh, documents, some additional paperwork. Uh, you may need to go through FAFSA verification. Um, so definitely stay on top of all that and answer your phones um, because your counselors, your college counselors will definitely need to contact you um, if they have any questions or need anything else from you. You don't want to miss any deadlines. You don't want to miss anything that's um, important in uh, getting what you need, especially for free uh, aid. So definitely um, reach out to your uh, college counselors. All colleges work differently. So um, admissions process uh, may mean everything from the admissions to from the applying all the way to financial aid. You'll be doing that directly with your admissions uh, counselor. Um, now there's some colleges or universities that you may have to go straight to the financial aid uh, planning office. And so you will have a financial advisor. Um, so make sure you contact that counselor, make sure you reach out to them and see how their college works. Now that you know that, depending on how their college works, you definitely want to set up a um, appointment and this can be, be an individual session uh, with your uh, college counselor or with your financial advisor, depending on how they do. Um, so those are different ways you can uh, go about that. Now, um, let's talk about other ways you can uh, get some help in terms of financial aid. So looking for financial um, aid, reach out to you, you know, use your community resources, go to your local library, go to your high school counselor. They are great um, in helping you find um, those classes, those, you know, let's go to this class and learn more about the financial process. Um, some colleges even put financial days. Uh, for you and your parents to learn more about the FAFSA and how that process works um, and even help you through the application. So that helps a lot. I'm going to be a little unprofessional right now, but I do have to plug in my computer. I am so sorry. I'm so sorry or else it was going to go completely off. But definitely do utilize those um, uh, local resources that you have out there for you. Also, um, let's talk about a little bit about the cost. So so I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about the cost for her. Um, so knowing how much things really cost. So like I was talking about earlier, there can be a lot of hidden costs. Um, and so things that are hidden costs that we mentioned before are things like, um, you know, do you have to pay for laundry? Do you have to pay for parking? Things of that nature. Um, ask which costs are mandatory. So things like meal plan and housing. You know, are you required to have a meal plan? Are you required to live on campus? Those types of things. Um, and so like we mentioned before, those are indirect costs and direct costs. Um, and I also mentioned about the aid being renewable. So just definitely important things to find out. Um, also, whenever you are going to accept your aid, you have to accept those words, awards. So she was talking about, Ms. Tracy was talking about the um, portal that a lot of the students give you. 
Um, so in that portal, you would actually have to go in and accept those awards. If you didn't accept those awards, then you're not going to receive them. A lot of students, until they make that final decision on, okay, I'm going to attend Mercer, I'm going to attend Campbell, they won't go in and accept those awards. And that's typically a really good policy because you don't want to go in and accept words, awards that you're not end up going to go to that you're not going to end up going to that school. Um, so the order does matter. And this is something I alluded to earlier. Um, you want to take all of the free money first. A lot of this seems like common sense, but whenever you're not sure what's free money and what's not, it muddies that water. And um, so free money first means that your scholarships that you're awarding, whether um, it's awarded from that school in the form of a merit um, or academic scholarship, it's called free money, you wanna take that first. Um, things like your federal Pell Grant, your North Carolina need-based. Um, I think in South Carolina, it's a Palmetto Scholarship. Um, there's a couple different options there, but take all of that free money first. The things that do not come with stipulations for repayment and um, you know those percentages for your interest and things like that. So first would be the free money. Second would be your earned money. So that's things like work study, where you're eligible for that, you qualify for a certain amount that you can receive, but you have to earn it by putting in those hours just like a typical job. And then your borrowed money would be less. So that's the things that you're gonna have to repay at some point. Um, so when you're looking at subsidized and unsubsidized loans, um, you know, you have one that goes ahead and starts accruing interest as soon as you hit accept and take that loan out. You have another that doesn't start accruing interest until you graduate from school. So these are all types of things that you'll learn about um, kind of as you go throughout the process that we want you to be aware of. Um, but definitely take that borrowed money last and don't take more than you need. So when you think about you qualify for, you know, 30,000 for a parent plus, but you only need 10,000. Just because you qualify for 30,000 does not mean you need to take it out. You can just take out the 10,000. Some students that really, really, really have the need for maybe paying for their rent or paying for their food out of those loans, a lot of times you can do that because it is part of your education. It is part of um, what you need in order to get through college. But the best thing to do for that would, to be see, to, would be to see about getting a job or something like that. Um, find out alternatives before having to take out a whole whole bunch of extra barred money. Um, so a lot of times on those financial aid awards, it'll say your total amount of aid that you get, like I said before, maybe it's $40,000 that you're eligible, eligible for with those loans. Um, and so parents are like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going to have to take out all of this money. And it's like, no, 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 no. You don't have to take and um, you don't have to take all of that out just because you qualify for it. Um, and on here, it does talk about out of pocket. So that amount that you have left over to pay, maybe you have $8,000 left to pay for that year. So maybe it's $4,000 um, for um, the first semester, for your, spring, for your fall semester. And maybe you have $2,000 you wanna pay towards school. You can pay that $2,000. The rest, you can do a payment plan. They're flexible with those as far as the business offices within your institutions. And um, that's who you would work with on that. So a lot of times, once again, it's on those websites and you can go on and you'll be able to see, um, you know, you can do a five month payment plan for this. And so basically it ends up being, you know, just that monthly payment that you would make. Um, or maybe that, that final amount that you do ends up being in a form of a loan. Um, so we are actually right at 1244, so time is wrapping up, um, but I hope that you guys learned a lot today. Yes, thank you so, so much, Kelsey. Um, they are going to, they are going to cut us off right at 1245, so I just wanted to make sure that, um, so I just want to make sure that I, that, that I had a chance to, to put up all of our contact um, info any questions that we haven't been able to answer, we are going to answer via email. And so I think the main thing to take from this is that we are here to help you. There is so much information and so many things that can be done. So any question or concern, please, please, please 
ask any of us, ask any school. That is what we are here for. Um, so thank you so much to Kelsey, Kyle, and, and to Tracy also. Um, and I hope that you guys have a great rest of your day. All right, thank you, um, uh, Kelsey, Allie, Tracy, and Kyle, very much for that information. Uh, it was wonderful information that we know our students and families are gonna need. Um, for all of the participants on today, um, when you click close this window, a very short, quick four question survey will appear. And we'd love for you to answer that so we can get feedback um, regarding what you felt about this type of presentation style. And remember, um, go to the CACRA website at CACRAO.org to sign up for more sessions. You'll see the virtual link listed there. And keep in mind too that any of the recordings from today, uh, as well as any other sessions will be posted out at CACRO at a later time. So we really appreciate you being with us today. And again, thank you to all the presenters for what, such a wonderful job uh, with sharing the information. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.